Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Dinu Santhu. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. Global brands cuts across religious, linguistic, and national barriers. Most of them follow a simple rule while dealing with politically and socially charged themes. Stay clear. But sometimes companies do stir up controversies. Recent social media posts associated with some global brands on Pakistan's so called Kashmir Solidarity Day is one such example. As the post invited backlash and also became a diplomatic issue, the companies hastened to put out clarifications. Our next report offers a peek into this tricky subject. Howard Schultz, American businessman and the former chairman and CEO of Starbucks, really meant well when he launched a drive to race together on the cups. But it did not go down well. Kathleen Day, a business journalist and lecturer at Johns Hopkins Carey Business School, Later told Fortune magazine that it backfired because people just wanted a cup of coffee. High street fashion chain Benetton was sued world over over a series of ads which were deemed provocative and distasteful by many. The man behind this controversial images of the Italian sportswear brand was legendary photographer Oliviero Toscani. After over two decades of association, the split came in April 2000. According to reports, Toscani was allegedly dumped by Benetton after the company's sales were hit in the US due to his advertisements, which once catapulted it to fame. Back home in India, several brands have also crossed their thin line, only to step back later. Two years ago, Bajaj Auto and Parley Products announced that they would not advertise their products on news channels that promote toxic content. That year, jewelry brand Tanishq had to pull down an advertisement showing an interfaith marriage after being trolled on Twitter and Facebook. The brand was accused of promoting Love Jihad. Surfixel's holy advertisement also drew similar backlash. And now, a recent social media post made by Hyundai's affiliate in Pakistan to commemorate the so-called Kashmir Solidarity Day has put the company in a tight spot in India. Hyundai is facing calls for a boycott by social media users in India and has now issued an apology. The matter also snowballed into a diplomatic row, with India's Ministry of External Affairs summoning South Korea's ambassador to express its strong displeasure over the social media post. The South Korean foreign minister, in a call with his Indian counterpart, has regretted the offence caused to Indians by the post. While Hyundai India said it stands strong on its ethos of respecting nationalism, in a statement on February 6th, its parent company apologised only on Tuesday. India said it expects foreign companies and their affiliates to refrain from making false and misleading comments on matters of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Similar posts by a Kia dealership in Pakistan and American fast food chains KFC and Pizza Hut's Pakistani arms have also drawn strong reactions in India, forcing them to pull down the comments. KFC India has apologized for the post made by the Pakistan-based franchise. Lloyd Mathias tells us what foreign companies should keep in mind when it comes to public communication. Fundamentally, I think global brands should certainly stay away from any geopolitical issues, right? I understand there's increasing pressure on brands to be participating and talking about social concerns which are relevant to their target audience or to their brand positioning. And that's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to geopolitical issues, I think that's an absolute no-no. For the simple reason that global brands obviously you know, op operate across geographies or operate across countries. And whenever they take a stand on a geopolitical issue, there is bound to be sensitivity. So I think it's completely a no-no. And uh, you know what I hear about certain brands doing it, I think completely is a is a, is an, a completely unpardonable lapse. I think it's a complete failure of their communications process. The way I look at it is that even for global companies which do not have a direct operation in a market and where they appoint a franchisee, yeah. I think the franchisee's role is largely in terms of building their business. But when it comes to putting out anything in the public domain, any communication, I think that has to go through some form of a process. I know we are living in a real-time world where everything is instant and 
you know, everything has to go real time. You need to have a very tight control on your communications process. Anything that goes out of a Twitter handle or an Instagram handle or any social media, which bears your company name, has to be at some level vetted. Another expert, Harish Bijur, says that global companies should also be careful when commenting on social issues. Firstly, I want to say that uh, the business of business is business. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, you know, and therefore, when I do say that, I typically mean to say uh, that brands must not wade into politics and religion. These are two things. And now I'm going to add geopolitics. Uh, it's not the business of brands to bother about that. Brands are global entities. Brands are meant to cater to consumers. And consumers uh, know no politics of this kind. So I think it's best avoided. Uh, social issues are fine, just as long as they don't tread onto the toes of politics and religion. So the moment you know there is a color of politics or religion on social issues, I advise my uh, corporate uh, clients typically to avoid it altogether. It's not worth it because these are troubled waters. Brands are not meant to irritate people. Brands are meant to unite, not divide. And these kind of participations divide, like the Hyundai example today. So if you really look at it, I think, you know, that local entity must have said, hey, this is the local day. It can create local jingoism. And I am a local brand as far as Hyundai Pakistan is concerned. It's for Pakistan. And it's not only Hyundai. KFC has done it. And numbers of other guys have done it. You know, that's a very, very narrow nationalistic way of looking at a brand. Where the mistake lies is that as far as Hyundai Global is concerned, uh, it's many entities have not been educated as to how local can they go. And if they go too local, they go anti-global. So a global brand cannot afford to be anything but global, which simply also means that a global brand cannot meddle in local affairs uh, at all. You must avoid it. Wading into political issues will do more harm than good for multinational companies. Hyundai is India's second largest car maker, selling over 5 lakh vehicles in the country last year and exporting over 1.3 lakh units. Meanwhile, its Pakistan venture sold just 8,903 cars in the whole of 2021. Companies would not want to risk a boycott in one of the world's biggest consumer markets. Several foreign brands such as Dior, Calvin Klein, American Airlines, McDonald's and Zara have learned similar lessons in the past. They have publicly apologized to Chinese consumers for either listing Taiwan and Hong Kong as separate countries on their website or using maps that China sees as misrepresenting its territory. Companies will have to learn to tread a cautious path when they operate across geographies. They simply cannot afford to take sides and make comments on geopolitical issues, riling one side or the other when the world is nothing but a one large market for them. After this peer disaster by some global giants, let us turn our attention to a homegrown multinational company that is making big strides towards becoming the world's largest generic pharmaceutical firm. In a conversation with business standards Shoini Das, Lupin CEO Vinita Gupta speaks of a company's growth plans in the US and China. Let's listen in. Uh, what, what are the uh, expectations uh, from the key brands, whether it's Solosec or Albuterol? If you can give us an idea and how is the uh, current pricing pressure, also cost pressure? you know, kind of affecting your plans or influencing it in the U.S. market? Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of the major products, uh, really the respiratory products have uh, become a major growth driver for us. Albuterol in particular has ramped up very nicely over the last uh, few quarters to um, um, a, a really material market share of 20% plus. Uh, likewise, uh, Bravana. Uh, another respiratory product where we got the authorized generic from Novian has uh, been a really good product for us. Um, you know, we now have uh, approximately 45% uh, share in that product uh, being the first generic to market. Um, so those are the two major products and the, the rest of our business has been, um, uh, you know, uh, um, stable. So are any big launches expected this year? 
Yeah, so uh, in the second half of next fiscal year, so this calendar year, uh, as well as uh, into the first quarter of uh, 23, um, you know, so our fiscal year 23, that is, um, we expect to launch uh, a couple of major products um, in the US. I mean, we have um, a Sioux Prep out of Somerset uh, that we expect to launch September, and uh, a Pectel Grastim, our first biosimilar in the US that was filed um, this past uh, calendar year. Uh, we hope to be able to um, get uh, the product approved. Um, you know, because there is increasing cost pressure also in the US market. So would you be shifting a lot of production to India just to have that cost arbitrage or advantage of uh, low cost production here? Yeah, we have done that uh, for a few products. Um, so, um, you know, one or, one or two of our nasal spray products that we developed in Somerset, we mm -hmm. transfer them to India. Um, and then we have uh, other uh, first to file products from there that we are also take transferring to um, contract manufacturers, um, um, both in the US as well as India. Now, we're always uh, looking at ways and means of uh, improving our cost position in products while risk mitigating. Your, uh, this quarter, the uh, performance is relatively muted. Uh, most of the uh, drug majors have had significant growth in the India business as we've seen in the quarterly results. Any specific reasons behind that? And uh, uh, if you could also elaborate on your COVID portfolio. So uh, our India business, actually, if you look at our RF business, year on year, it's grown 12%. So it's mm -hmm. been a solid quarter on quarter. I'm saying sequentially, there's, uh, it's slightly... Uh, sequentially is roughly flat. Um, you know, last quarter was a significant increase in uh, respiratory products for us uh, mm -hmm. because of which you see a little bit of flatness. But if you see year to date uh, growth, you know, which uh, is would be a better way to look at growth or, court, uh, you know, uh, year over year growth, there's, um, you know, because of seasonality as well, there is significant mm -hmm. growth in, in the India business is 12 percent growth, actually. Um, in the India region formulation business. Uh, and the COVID products are, uh, we were very pleased to launch uh, Molnupiravir, uh, our, our brand, uh, in time with, uh, with the surge of the Omicron um, uh, variant. Um, uh, but it's just started, it's a, it's a couple of weeks ago that right. we launched the product. So it's um, a very small part of our portfolio at this point in time. A bigger contribution as we see, uh, you know, again, more to come on it because we have just established is uh, with the diagnostics business. So another pivot is the China entry that you had mentioned earlier. So mm -hmm. yeah, significant developments there, any partnerships that we can uh, you know, talk about now? Yeah, so we recently announced uh, the relationship with Fonoco on our CNS products. Yeah. which um, uh, we were very pleased with and um, um, are looking forward to uh, uh, both uh, filing as well as getting those products approved and launched in China through the partnership. Uh, we're actively working on the rest of our pipeline, um, in particular our inhalation pipeline, our respiratory products um, that we have developed for the U.S., uh, Spiriva, uh, you know, the Respimat products, um, as well as the Ellipta platform products, all material opportunities for us in China. And we're developing the pipeline for China, simultaneously working on entry strategy. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Take care. Thank stay you. Safe. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You as well. Some analysts have issued a buy call on Lupin, the shares of which dipped to 786 rupees a piece on Tuesday. Let us now see if investors can also benefit from the Brent crude rally. Brent crude prices have been on a one-way rally since the start of the year, rising about 20% so far in 2022. This has pulled back equities from their recent highs as oil price rise can lead to inflation and hamper the government's import bills. Our next report looks into whether investors can benefit from this.
Brent crude is hovering around $92 per barrel mark, even as faint signs of progress in nuclear talks between the United States and Iran emerge. If US sanctions are lifted, Iran could export millions of barrels of crude and help to drive down red-hot oil prices. However, the move may not be enough to cool off the prices as tensions remain high in Eastern Europe. Crude prices have rallied about 20% this year and 16% in the past month as tensions between Russia and NATO simmered over Ukraine. Technically, if WTI March holds $91.6 level, it could rise up to $93.6 levels. Analysts worry oil prices are headed higher and can hit $125 a barrel by June 2022 given these tensions and a pickup in demand over the months ahead. Platts Analytics, for instance, expects India's gasoline demand to grow about 5% in 2022 after rising 12% in 2021. JY Lim, advisor, oil markets, S&P Global Paths Analytics said, India's gasoline demand had already recovered back to above 2019 levels. The resurgence of COVID-19 in the country is expected to slow down in Q1, but we still see growth for the whole of 2022 as the situation starts to improve. Mobility seems to be picking up as daily infections have started to ease. But rising crude oil prices may not be all that bad news, especially for companies that are engaged in drilling and extraction of oil. These street mavens are bullish on the road ahead for oil drilling companies such as ONGC, Oil India and Reliance Industries, which could gain from a rise in crude oil prices. Another sector that is likely to benefit is electric vehicles, as people may opt to buy EVs instead of vehicles that run on conventional fuel. We have with us A.K. Prabhakar, Head of Research at IDBI Capital, to elaborate on it. ONGC, Oil India to an extent, even Reliance gets benefit from that. No. and uh, Hindustan oil explosion because all these companies no, they depend on it you know, pipeline companies will benefit you know, because you know Gale you know, GSPL these are pipeline companies where they will not have in, any impact no. so any company which is there in EV segment like uh, Sonacom you know, and uh, there is one more endurance technology which is a supplier for EV. Because more the crude prices go up, you know, EV vehicle will take off. So there can be few things, sir. Not uh, sir, the impact of crude, you know, we need to take it also. Because when crude goes down, nobody increases the capacity and you know, everybody were lethargic this time. So I think, you know, 100 is very sustainable for some time and it will have an impact on our market. Technical chartists to remain bullish on these stocks from a medium-term perspective and expect these stocks to gain between 10 and 15% in the next 6 to 8 months. Let's go to business standards of Dood Bakker to know more. Nifty Oil & Gas Index is currently witnessing consecutive resistance placed at 7,800 and 8,000 levels. On the lower side, 7,200 remains a strong support and as long as this index honors this support, one can see a recovery in the upward trend. Stocks like Bharat Petroleum, Hindustan Petroleum and Oil India Oil Corporations are witnessing sideways movement and either side breakout would determine the next course of action for these stocks. Whereas stocks like ONGC and Oil India at the current juncture, looking at the different formations and the chart patterns, these two stocks are really placed well. ONGC, as long as it holds support of 160 level, it can see a jump of 15% and can see a level of 200 rupees. For Oil India, which is having a formation of higher high, higher low, it can easily jump to 260, a jump of 10%. These two stocks, ONGC and Oil India, according to the charts, are on the process, are holding the bullish buyers. A mild dip in oil prices and bond yields on Tuesday did cap downside in the markets yesterday as benchmark indices snapped their three-day losing run. The PSE Sensex is now at 57,808 while the Nifty 50 is at 17,267 as global headwinds keep investors on their toes. Today, investors will react to Q3 earnings of Bharti Airtel and IRCTC announced post-market hours yesterday and will eye quarterly results of ACC. Burger Paints, Nika, and Tata Power, among others. From Mumbai's bustling Talal Street, 
Let us now shift our focus to the quiet central axis of New Delhi. The manicured lawns, gardens and the buildings around India Gate and Raisina Hill, which are now giving way to the government's central Vista project. This report explains what this project is about and how the heart of Delhi will look once it is completed. The Housing and Urban Affairs Ministry has been allocated 2600 crore rupees in Union Budget 2022-23 for the construction of non-residential office buildings of the Central Vista Redevelopment Project, including the Parliament and Supreme Court. This is 767.56 crore rupees more than rupees 1833.43 crore given in the last fiscal. For residential purposes, the ministry has been given 873 crore rupees. The Central Vista is India's central administrative area located in New Delhi. During the colonial era, leading British architects Edwin Lutyens and Herbert Baker had designed the Central Vista complex. It was inaugurated in 1931 and comprised Rashtrapati Bhavan, Parliament House, North and South Blocks and the Record Office which was later named as the National Archives along with the India Gate Monument and the Civic Gardens on the either side of the Rajpath. The redevelopment of Central Vista was conceived in September 2019 involving multiple projects spread over six years and estimated to cost 20,000 crore rupees. Facing flag from opposition over it, the government said that a new parliament building was needed as the current one dates back to the 1920s and shows signs of distress and overuse. The planned redevelopment works include the new triangular parliament building, chambers for members of parliament, the Central Vista Avenue, 10 buildings of the Common Central Secretariat, Central Conference Centre, additional buildings for National Archives, new Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts Building, facilities for security officials and official residences for the Vice President, Prime Minister, Executive Enclave with Prime Minister's Office, Cabinet Secretariat, National Security Council Secretariat, relocation of National Museum in North and South Block, etc. All these projects are planned in a phased and sequential manner till 2026. The project for new parliament building has been awarded at an estimated cost of 862 crore rupees to Tata projects while the project for rejuvenation of Central Vista Avenue has been awarded at an estimated cost of 477 crore rupees to Shapurji Palonji Group. The new parliament building is scheduled to be completed by October 2022. At present, 39 ministries are housed on the Central Vista, whereas 12 ministries have offices outside the Vista. As part of the redevelopment, all the 51 ministries are proposed to be located at one location to improve coordination. The present buildings of the Central Vista shall be replaced with modern office buildings with capacity to hold about 54,000 personnel. All these offices are proposed to be connected through a loop of automated underground people mover over ground shuttles and walkways. Last year, Larson & Tubro was awarded the contract for the construction and maintenance of the first three of the ten buildings of the Common Central Secretariat. Six infrastructure firms are now in the race to win the contract to construct the Executive Enclave, which will house the new PMO, Cabinet Secretariat, India House and National Security Council Secretariat. A Nav Bharat Udyan is also planned along the Yamuna River as part of the project, which will stretch from the India Gate till the river. building which is part of the Central Vista project will have a seating capacity for about 1400 MPs. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, log into our website www.business-standard.com. We too will be back tomorrow morning with more. Stay tuned and thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.